Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on this um, lovely sunny afternoon. I am Samantha Shokin. I manage public programs at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust in New York City. I'd like to welcome you to today's book talk on The Escape Artist with Helen Fremont. Um, Helen's new memoir, uh, The Escape Artist, is out now with Simon and & Schuster. And in the book, Helen writes about growing up with parents who pretended to be Catholics, but were in fact Jew Jewish survivors of Nazi-occupied Poland. The memoir was selected by the New York Times as an editor's choice new book and by People Magazine as a best new book in February of this year. Helen's previous memoir, After Long Silence, was a national bestseller. Her works of fiction and nonfiction have appeared in numerous journals and anthologies, including Prize Stories, the O. Henry Awards, Plowshares, and the Harvard Review. We are joined today by veteran jour journalist and author Helen Epstein, author of the tr trilogy Children of the Holocaust, Where She Came From, A Daughter's Search for Her Mother's History, The Long Half-Lives of Love and Trauma, and most recently, Francie's War. Helen Fremont and Helen Epstein have been writing partners for the past 20 years, and they both live in the Boston area from where they are joining us today. So welcome, Helen Fremont and Helen Epstein. Thank you. Hello. Uh, hello. So I thought I would start just by reading a couple very short sections um, from the beginning of The Escape Artist. Um, sisters are set up. Shot from the same cannon, you're sent on a blind date for the rest of your lives. My sister, Lara, and I had a script we were supposed to follow. My mother and her sister, Zosha, had written it and they were our role models, which is pretty scary when you consider what they had been through. During the war, Zosha had saved my mother's life. Or maybe it was the other way around. The stories were twisted, and my mother and aunt were bound together in ways Laura and I didn't begin to understand, but we did our best to follow for most of our lives. Although Zosha lived in Italy and we lived in upstate New York, mom and Zosha's love was formidable, the stuff of legend built on a mythic past. One day, they told us, my sister and I would have what they had. But unlike my mother and aunt, Laura and I didn't have any real wars to test our bond. We had to make up our own. Uh, I'll skip ahead a little bit and read another short section uh, from childhood. And it starts with um, a bit about my father, who uh, was in forced labor camps in the Siberian Gulag for six years during and after the war. While my father was in Siberia, fellow prisoners had broken his left elbow while trying to steal his clothes. Years later, surgeons in Italy removed the calcified joint and sewed him back together, but he never recovered full use of his arm. My father tried not to speak of his years as a prisoner, but he acted like a man who had lived with beasts. He wolfed his meals in seconds, and nothing my mother said or did could get him to slow down. I can't, he'd say helplessly. It's food. He kept ferociously busy, saw patients day and night, built rock ledges behind the house, planted bushes, mulched trees, chopped wood. One year, he bought a thousand evergreens and planted them across the grounds, along the driveway, all over the lawn. He was a colossus of efficient, if furious, energy. At night, his shrieking nightmares jolted us awake. The next morning, my mother would dismiss them with a weary shrug, saying, the gulag again, as if genocide were just one more annoyance that kept intruding into our lives. We never knew when an image or a sound or a fight between my sister and me would trip the invisible wire and my father would blurt 
about a horrifying in incident from the camps. Or my mother would cry, I should have died with my parents. Don't you understand? We shouldn't be alive. My sister and I would freeze. The whole planet froze as we watched our parents being stolen from us by the past. These moments would never be spoken of afterward. Our family circled them with a thick layer of silence around which my sister and I tiptoed, magically thinking that if we were careful, we could avoid sparking another explosion. Through such experiences, Lara and I laid down the framework of our own story. We absorbed their secrets and turned them, our, turned them into our own drama. Maybe it wasn't an exact translation of our parent tool. The best we could do. Um, Helen, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think there might be something uh, wrong with your microphone. Oh, uh, okay. I'm hearing some interference, uh, so maybe better? you're brushing over it. Yeah, it's making like a crackling sound. I think that's better. Just just be mindful of uh, where oh, the microphone is placed. Right. Yeah, no worries. Okay, um, I'll just say, through such experiences, Laura and I laid down the framework of our own story. We absorbed their secrets and turned them into our own drama. Maybe it wasn't an exact translation of our parents' war, but it was the best we could do with what we had. To mom and dad's unspoken past, we added our own hunger, the rapacity of children who have everything and still want more, love, attention, adoration. Laura and I fought each other as if battling for the last scrap of oxygen in the house, as if there were room in our parents' hearts for only one child. So I'll stop there and um, give Helen Epstein a chance to chime in or ask any questions if you have. Well, one of my questions over the last 20 years of working with you, since I don't have a sister, I have two brothers, I was so struck by the two pairs of sisters in, in, in your story and how you and your sister were really a team when you started out your research in the early 1990s, I think it was. So I wondered, especially for those of, of, of the listeners who, who haven't read your first book, could you tell us how much you and your sister knew when you started this journey and how much you know now? Well, this was back in 1992 that we first started um, doing some research. And at that time we were both in our mid thirties and we really knew nothing about our family. And we were very closely bound, uh, bound because um, as far as we knew, we just had a mother, a father, and our aunt, Zosha, my mother's older sister, who lived in Italy, and she had married an Italian count. And we would later find out that he was actually the only true Catholic in our family. So my sister and I knew nothing about, we didn't even know the names of our own grandparents. I mean, there were no other relatives in our lives at, at all. And as far as we knew, there were none. None had survived the war. And so the first thing we did was we sat down with our parents and asked for the names of their parents. And we asked for their birthdays or approximately the year in which their parents had been born, and also the towns, um, the villages in Eastern Poland that their parents were from. And what excuse did you give your parents for why you were suddenly asking this? Well, my, my sister was um, doing a fellowship in child psychiatry at the time. And this was one of the things they had to do was, um, was create a family tree. And our family was like a family twig. So there, there really was nothing there. And so um, my sister asked my mother and father, you know, just for the name so that she could fill out this twig and make a few more branches on it. So that's how my parents were all on board to help her with this, you know, academic uh, research. And then, um, 
you know, this was before the internet. So all we had were, was snail mail and uh, friends of hers suggested that she send it to the American Red Cross or the International Red Cross and then to um, a Holocaust museum in Israel we'd never heard of to Yad Vashem because she thought, well, maybe um, we'll find there are some other relatives out there or who, people who know about our family. So she did and then about a month later we got this huge packet of documents from a rabbi at Yad Vashem. And he had looked at the archives and had found just a ton of pages of testimony from other survivors. And these were pages of um, paper. They were basically called paper tombstones because there was no other record of how all of these people had been killed and there was no record that they'd even existed. So, uh, in fact, yeah. <laughs> that's your dog. Uh, so what happened was, um, the Excuse me one second. I just wanted oh. to ask you, had you ever heard of Yad Vashem at this point? Never. I never heard of Yad Vashem. <laughs> and, you know, I, I mean, Israel was basically a place on a map as right. far as I was concerned. Um, so we got these pages of testimony and it was, they were filled out by people who had survived and then made a recording or uh, uh, paper filled out forms that uh, told of the fate of all of their relatives and their, their friends who did not survive. So for my sister and me, we suddenly found out not only that we were Jewish, but that we had dozens and dozens and dozens of family members we'd never known existed. We had aunts and we had uncles and we had cousins and we had, it was just overwhelming information. And in addition to getting their names and where they were from and their dates of birth and their kids and how they were related, we also got sort of this harrowing information of how every one of them had been killed and where and how and what date. And so we found out, you know, this one with his wife and three children were shot in the Tartakower forest. And these were all shipped off to Belgians and gassed. And this one was uh, starved in the ghetto. So it was just such an overwhelming amount of information that my sister and I um, started doing a lot of research and our parents- now, Did you tell your parents at this point or did you to keep it a secret just for yourselves? Did you tell anyone else? No, well, we told, we, we started talking to rabbis, we started talking to historians, we started talking to other uh, Holocaust survivors and we, our parents had very close friends who were Jewish Holocaust survivors and many of them were still alive. And so we started to talk to them and they told us that our parents had sworn them to secrecy, but they shared with us what they knew. And, um, and we were very cautious about approaching our parents because at this point, you know, it was very loaded and we were afraid of shocking them um, until we knew more information. And we also were getting different um, advice from different people. The, the psychiatrists and psychologists that we consulted were all saying that we had to talk to our parents, that only that way would enable healing. And then the rabbis, of course, were all saying, you mustn't talk to your parents. It will just open old wounds and it will re-traumatize them. And in the end, we did talk to our parents just because they're our parents and we didn't want to keep the secret from them that we knew they were keeping a secret from us. And we ended up um, going back to Ukraine. They were from Eastern Poland, but it was now Ukraine. Wait a minute, wait a minute, you skipped that. So, so what happened? The two of you staged a, a, a meeting with your parents? We did. We sat down with them and at first they denied it. They denied that they were Jewish. They denied that anybody, they said it was all lies. And we spent about two or three hours with them. And we said, we, we are not trying to do, you know, an examination of you. We, are, we have the information. We have more than enough information. So it's not that we're asking you to verify this. We are, we know more than we, we even need to know. What we're trying to do is open up a channel of communication. And we want you to know that we love you. We understand. Um, we, we do not want you to feel exposed, but we want you to feel free to share with us whatever and whenever um, you can. And what was their reaction? 
my mother said she would first have to check with her sister Zosha that she had made a vow to her sister to keep this silent. And so she invited us to come back months later after my aunt would be visiting us from the States and she wanted to first talk with my aunt about it and basically get permission from my aunt to say anything. Um, and my father in the meantime was just, you know, sort of uh, straining at the bit to tell us. I mean, it was, he would sort of corner us in the room and say, oh, you know, my mother's name was Helena Rosenbaum, you know, and he was trying to feed us a little bit of information uh, about being Jewish without my mother hearing. So the secrets within the secrets were, I mean, it, it was just the way we operated as a family. Now, I've always been curious about your father's story. You know, I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of um, survivor families, but I've interviewed relatively few people who's, where a parent had survived in Siberia. And I, he, had, he was there for six years. Right. And I wanted to know how, how you learned about that. Well, my father had always been more open about his story. He never admitted that he was Jewish. He, he complied with my mother's and aunt's requirement that he not disclose that. But um, he actually wanted his story to be told. Um, so he wrote a memoir after he retired as a doctor. He wrote his memoir and he tried to get it published. But um, my father was not patient with many people and he was had no patience for editors, so he did not get it published, but he allowed me to help him select a few sections, and we polished them up, and they were published as essays in the Harvard Review. So he was quite open about telling the, the stories of how he had survived Siberia, and basically the way, the reason he was deported in the first place is, um, in 1939, um, he was in his final year of medical school at the University of Lvov, which is a city all the way in the easternmost part of Poland. And my mother and he had been dating for a number of years, and they were engaged to be married as soon as he got his medical degree, and then they were going to marry and settle down. Instead, in 1939, the war broke out, and the Germans invaded Poland from the west, the Russians invaded Poland from the east. And so their city of Lvov came under the Russian occupation, at least for the first two years of the war. And as soon as my father got his medal degree, he was immediately arrested by the Russian police, by the NKVD, which is now like the KGB. And um, he was deported to Siberia as a socially dangerous element. So he was a political prisoner because he was anti-communist and he was also a member of the intelligentsia. He had his medical degree and so they considered him dangerous and he was sentenced to 10 years of forced labor above the Arctic Circle in Siberia in the camps. And basically that was a death sentence because nobody could survive under those conditions. And even if you did, the requirements would have been, at, if he had completed his 10 years, he would have had to spend the rest of his life within a one kilometer circumference or, or diameter of the, of the uh, I'm sorry, uh, range of the camp outside its borders. So nothing further was heard from my mother and her family. No one heard boot from my father for six years. That was it. And they assumed he was dead. Instead, in 1946, he managed to escape by himself and he jumped a train holding on with just one arm because his other arm had been broken. Uh, and he traveled hanging onto a train for days and made it back to Lvov, to their hometown, home city, which was now under Russian occupation. And he found out that everyone had been killed. His family had been killed. My mother's family had been killed, but only my mother had managed to escape by dressing as an Italian soldier and marching out of Poland to Italy with the Italian army. And so he found out that she was alive. She had survived and was living in Rome with her older sister and brother-in-law. So he decided that he would, uh, he would try to join her. And so he walked across Europe 
by night as a fugitive. And several months later, he finally arrived in Rome and he married my mother 10 years to the day since they'd first met. So. Right, so another amazing story. So you told most of that story in your first book, After Long Silence. Now, yeah. can you tell us what happened after you published that book and what led you to write this current book, The Escape Artist? Well, um, within a week of publication of After Long Silence, and that was in February of 1999, the book came out. And about a week later, I got a phone call from a woman in Iowa City, and she said, Helen, this is Susan Simon. I'm calling from Iowa City, and I'm your cousin, and I've been waiting 30 years to reach <laughs> out and get in touch with you because we have known all about you and your sister, but your mother swore us to secrecy. And it was her father, Susan Simon's father, Mendel Goldberg, who had written many of the pages of testimony, which enabled us to find out all of this information about our family. And in fact, her father was very, very close to my mother and, um, and had actually lived with her family and worked for her own father through, throughout her adolescence and into her early, well, 20s, I guess, is when the, the, uh, the war broke out. But um, as it turned out, her father lived three hours away from my parents. He lived in Brooklyn. My parents were in upstate New York. And they got together every single year. They would celebrate bar mitzvahs of his kids. They would celebrate weddings. They would celebrate birthdays. And they knew about me and my sister, because my mother would send them our first grade picture, our second grade picture, our everything. They followed our lives intimately, and they respected my mother's requirement that they never contact us because she didn't. So want everybody us. was sworn to secrecy. You broke the secret, and you broke it in a spectacular way. You wrote a book that became a bestseller. So, right. what happened to you and your parents, and to well, you and your sister? The first thing that happened was um, I sent the book to my parents before it was published, and I heard back from my father within a week, and, and he basically said, you know, I am hurt because you are telling stories that we did not intend for public consumption. But his next sentence is, so much for ethical squabbling. It's a really good book, congratulations, and, you know, love dad. And he continued to be in correspondence with me after the book. He was sort of in some ways um, pleased that the story was, was published um, and that his story, in, in fact, came out through my book. But the problem was that he was suffering from Parkinson's and living at home and under my mother's care. And my mother was absolutely devastated by the publication of the book. Even though she knew that I'd been working on it for six years, and even though she had at some point just said, okay, change the names, which I did, change the locations, which I did. But it was, um, you know, she was in already 80, and my sister and I were already in our 40s, and I wasn't anticipating such a dramatic, um, response from my mother to the point that she refused to speak to me or see me. I sent her a Mother's Day gift. She sent it back unopened. She, you know, refused to have anything to do with me. And so my father and I continued to communicate, um, but my mother cut me off. And it wasn't until three years later that my mother picked up the phone and told me that my father had finally died. He was 86 when he died. And she invited me home for the memorial service. And so I went home and it was a very, very emotional reunion with my mother. And we talked and we cried and we laughed and we just talked nonstop for about a day and a half. And then after that, for the next six weeks, we had this very, very loving exchange of correspondence until one day, um, it was Christmas Eve, in fact, of 2001, I got kind of a bulky envelope from my mother 
and I opened it up and it was a bunch of legal documents and it included my father's will and the final page was a codicil and that codicil removed me from the will it disowned me and it declared me dead and it was obvious from the way the will and the codicil were written that my sister and my mother and my father were all complicit in basically killing me off um, in this piece of paper and i hadn't been I, I hadn't seen that coming so i really had to stop and think what there was more to the story that i hadn't understood and um and that you tell that story in your book. Yeah, so that's the news. I have just one more question because I know people are dying to ask you their own questions. So here's a question that I'm not sure anyone would dare to ask you. <laughs> um, I, I know a lot about your family history of therapy, and I think it would be really helpful to some of our listeners if you kind of gave us a summary, given the enormous secrecy in your family. Yeah. Um, which is probably the more the most secrecy I've ever heard of any survivor family. How on earth did you guys go to family therapy? And what did you do in your own therapy? Well, I, you know, we were obviously from very early age, our family was a complete train wreck. Um, and so, you know, my, my parents were, were having these flashback, horrible, intrusive memories. My sister and I were at each other's throats. And so, when I was eight years old in 1965, um, our family, you know, my father was the one who really sort of enrolled us all in family therapy. Um, and my sister was kind of a wild child. And so we went through the motions of going in to see a family therapist. And, but my parents wouldn't talk about the past. They lied about who they were. So they wouldn't admit that they were Jewish. They didn't breathe a word about the war, the Holocaust, or, or being sole survivors. I mean, it was apparent from their accents that they were from Europe. But um, years later, like 25 years later, when my sister and I were, were already researching our past. We went back and found the, um, the psychiatrist who had treated us. She was now in her 70s. And we said, did you know we were Jewish? And she said, no, I had no idea. And, <laughs> you know, did you know that they were Holocaust survivors? And she said, no, I'm, I'm a little ashamed to say that back then in the 60s, as psychiatrists, we were very intimidated by uh, the trauma of the Holocaust. And we were very happy not to talk about it. So your parents didn't want to say a word about their history. We were happy to not say anything at all. And then she also admitted that they hadn't been able to do much for our family, which was basically, I think, our therapy sessions for, for years when I was a child um, were, were staging areas for, for enormous fights that we'd later explode. And then we'd show up the next week and we'd tell the fight that we had had the previous week before, and then that would just set us off again. So I would say it was probably um, contraindicated. but. I, and it also turned me off from therapy. I was convinced that therapists will just make you more crazy um, until I was in law school. And when I was uh, about 20, 21, 22, I was about the age that my mother was when she was going through, when she was under the Nazi occupation, I developed an eating disorder. And I finally realized I couldn't tackle it myself. I did Weight Watchers. I did everything. And I finally um, went to my mother and my sister and said, look, I, I think I'm going to need some, some professional help. And so my mother was very adamant that I could get cognitive therapy, behavior modification, but nothing that talked about my childhood, nothing that uncovered anything in the past. You know, so she was like, okay, you should go see a psychiatrist, but specifically just to treat the behavior of, um, of eating or overeating or binging. And I, you know, spent basically shared my salary with psychiatrists ever since then. <laughs> and um, and in, in the course of my uh, adulthood, finally uh, found a, a therapist who was able to help me. Uh, but it took a long time. And I think part of that was because I was so well trained 
not only to not share myself with other people, but I did not, I was unable to share my own heart with myself. I mean, it mm -hmm. took forever mm -hmm. for me to figure out who I was or what mattered to me or what I even wanted. I mean, it, I was so blended with my parents' expectations and they were my heroes. So I never had to question who am I? What do I want? What do I prefer? Which subjects do I like better in school? It, it was irrelevant. I just was following the game plan my parents set. And I thought I would be the happiest person in the world if I just made my parents proud. And so that was my goal. And it became increasingly difficult by the time I was in my 20s. Mm. Samantha, I think it's over to you now. Yes, thank you so much, Helen. What an incredible story um, and relatable on so many levels. Uh, and I will be sure to include a link in the follow-up uh, so people can go and buy your book and l learn more about your family history and your, and your personal history. Um, so we do have a couple of questions already from uh, our, our viewers and listeners. This one comes from Marka, oh, sorry, Marsha Jacobson, who asks, uh, Helen, do you observe either Catholicism or Judaism, and how does re religion figure into your own life now? That's a great question, because, um, you know, for basically 35 years, I was terribly ignorant, um, non-practicing Catholic, and it was hard for me to even identify as Catholic. And then I immediately embraced Judaism. It just made so much sense. I felt, this is it. I'm definitely Jewish. But um, I felt so uh, outside the experience because I didn't know the language. I didn't, you know, we went to a, our first service with friends and I didn't understand it at all. And so I felt excluded and, um, and I had this great aspiration that I was going to learn, you know, Hebrew and I was going to study Jewish history and I was going to, you know, and, and I just never did. My sister, um, by contrast, you know, was immediately started studying, immediately learned Hebrew and like within 45 minutes was bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah. And, and <laughs> you know, I, I sort of have gone from being a really bad Catholic being a bad Jew, but uh, there's no question that my sense of identity is very, very strongly uh, identified as Jewish and probably always had, just didn't realize it. In fact, most of my friends, when I came out with this great secret at the age of 35, when I got the, the news that I'm Jewish, I would go to my friends and say, my God, sit down. You won't believe this. I'm Jewish. And they would go, are you kidding? I could have told you that. I, you didn't know you were Jewish? What's, you know, so. Latent Judaism. <laughs> very, very cool. Um, okay, we have a, a few more questions here. So this one's from Ellen Greenberg, who asks, uh, I'm curious about the meaning behind the title of the book, The Escape Artist. Can you speak to that a bit? Yeah, that's, um, The Escape Artist uh, is something that my mother accused me of being in the most pejorative way when I was a kid because um, I always wanted to do stuff. I had friends outside the family. I wanted to play with my friends. I wanted to go out, you know, the movies. I wanted to go out to sports events. And my mother considered those acts of betrayal and disloyalty of our family that really, you, you know, if, if um, the weekends were, were meant to be together with family and if I had any interest beyond just a passing casual interest in others, that was, I was always accused of trying to escape our family, which unfortunately, given the fact that being with our family was usually tearing our hair out and having these horrible fights. It was like, mm, there was an element of truth to that. So I was always considered selfish, whereas my sister was a much more loyal daughter. And, um, and then when I grew older and when I was writing this book, um, it occurred to me that what my mother resented most about my impulse to get out and have my own life was something she could never forgive herself for. And that is that she escaped the Nazis and left her parents alone and she knew that they would die. And in fact, months later, they were gassed at Belgets and she had never was able to forgive herself for basically escaping, surviving and living uh, without her parents. So I think that the, the escape artist is both 
uh, what I was accused of being as a child, but it's also, if not for her escape, if not for my father's escape, I wouldn't be here. So that's it. Wow. Um, well, there are a couple of questions here about your relationship with your father. Um, uh, uh, sorry, Debbie, Debbie Rothstein's, Rothstein asks, um, what happened with your father? And Tommy Schnurmacher wants to know specifically why you were disowned by him and if your mom said anything about it. Yes. Um, I found out afterwards when I went home for the memorial service, I found out much more um, from my mother. And, and then even after that, I found out later from my sister that my father was very determined to have continue his relationship with me. And he, in order to um, continue living under my mother's roof, in which I was not allowed to, um, to show up, what they did is they reached an agreement that my father could continue to correspond with me by sending me letters and cards. And, but since he was unable physically, to mail them, take them down to the mailbox. He couldn't walk, he could barely move his hands at that point. He'd had Parkinson's for a good 15 years. Uh, my mother agreed that as long as he could write the letters and write my address, she would place a stamp and take it to the mailbox. That's as much as she would do for him. And that she continued to do for the, the three years until he died. Um, the codicil, there's this one page, so the will that my father wrote, which is exactly the same will that my mother had as well, um, basically left everything to my sister and to me equally. And the one page codicil was, was executed just a couple months before his death. And it was obvious that my mother had taken him to this lawyer that I had never heard of before in, in upstate New York. And I didn't know that then, but when she died in 2013, she died uh, almost 13 years later, she had the same exact codicil executed. And um, I think that she basically told my father that it was I who would not have anything to do with him. And I believe that because Years later, my sister found um, the letters that I had been sending home, and my sister didn't realize that I had been trying to reach out to my mother. So she had, my mother had told them that I had abandoned the family. And, um, and I know that my sister was part of it simply because in that codicil, they didn't just delete Helen Fremont, delete Helen Fremont, delete Helen Fremont. They replaced me with my sister's partner and my sister's swim coach from college. So everything, it wasn't just excising me, it was also fortifying my sister. So it was, I believe, um, my mother could not cope with this crisis of she had made an agreement to her sister and she absolutely could not reveal or let out the story. So I think that she basically, as she had all our lives, lied to my father and said that I didn't want to have anything to do with him, even though I was writing him. Thank you. Um, and I, I have a question of my own actually that's uh, for both of the Helens. Um, so I'm curious what it was like growing up as children of survivors when the field of trauma studies was just emerging and uh, were there any support networks for other children of survivors or how did you find one another? Uh, could you talk about that a little bit? Well, um, actually, it, 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 for me, it happened 20 years before the 80s. It happened in the 60s. Um, I grew up in, on the Upper West Side of New York City and there were Holocaust survivors around. And in fact, I went to school with a lot of kids of refugees. But at the time, and this was the 50s, Samantha, <laughs> I was born in 1947. So in the 50s, people just did not 
talk about where they came from. They, they, everybody wanted to be American. Like in Israel, everybody wanted, to, everybody wanted to be a Sabra. And you just didn't talk about the past. And in high school, my, two of my closest friends were kids of survivors. And I, we, never just, we never talked about it. I remember I used to go over to my friend's Mary's house and her parents were Polish Jews, not unlike Helen Fremont's parents. And they never left the house. They were very, very pale. And one time I asked her, I said, Mary, you know, why do your parents never leave the house? They owned the house. It was a, it was a, it was a, a three, three or four story house on West End Avenue. And um, they said, well, um, they think that if they left the house, it might burn down. And I didn't say, oh, that's weird. I didn't say, oh, that's crazy. I just kind of nodded and said, okay. That makes sense. <laughs> and we went on. You know, so that was that was how I grew up. Then I went to Israel for college. And that's where I really started beginning to research um, the second generation. Because when I was a student in Israel in 1967, 68, 69, all of these kids of survivors from all over the world, from Australia, from Europe, from South America, uh, came to Jerusalem prompted by the, the, the Six Day War. And I realized that there was something really strange about this group, that I felt more comfortable with this group of people than I did with American Jews, and that they all were like me, that they all um, lacked extended family. They all spoke three or four languages, the language of the place that they grew up and the language of their parents. And so that was really the kernel of um, my consciousness of second generation. I don't know about Helen. <laughs> Well, it's perfect um, piggyback because if not for Helen Epstein, I don't know if I ever would have picked up on anything. <laughs> um, but I remember I was in law school and just absolutely at a loss in terms of any sort of uh, sense of who I was. I just reached a point of depression despair that I was... Um, probably, well, I was struggling, if not drowning at that point. And I happened to be, um, I had a, uh, a clerkship at a law firm in Troy, New York. And there was this tiny little um, drugstore that had a little paperback book rack. And it had, you know, these basically heaving bosom sort of covers. And then there was Children of the Holocaust. And I was immediately drawn to it. I pulled it out. I start open this book and I could not put it down. And I I was just like, oh my God, this woman, Helen Epstein, whoever she is, she grew up at our kitchen table. And I was like, we're not Jewish, but everything else about my childhood and my experience with my parents was like spot on. It was, it, it was as if she had taken tracing paper and, and traced out our family, except we were Catholic. That was the only difference. But um, <laughs> aside from that, I just was blown away by this. And I was, I was, um, you know, I sort of took red, red ink and underlined all the passages and I would cry and then I'd have to go for a run. And then I would, you know, it was so moving and so powerful. In fact, this, this, um, I should, I think I have it. I have it. There it is. <laughs> wow. The original. And I should, um, here's like, this is, this, it looks like blood. <laughs> you know, I underlined all these passages. This became the Bible. Like if I'm ever, you know, any therapist had to first read this book before they could talk to me, any, any potential love interest. Um, my wife had to read this book, you know, by the second date, you know, so this was the sort of thing that, that told me who I was. And, um, and then many years later, I, Helen Epstein came to my city, like moved to Cambridge. I was living in Boston and she was giving a class on nonfiction. And one of the classes was going to be on children of the Holocaust. And I had to do like these major acrobatics because I was, uh, I was new at this job as a lawyer and her course was offered at like two in the afternoon when I was supposed to be chained to my desk and I had to get permission from our council to go to this one-time class. And I went to it and I went up to her and I was like, oh my God, you changed my life. This is the most uh, powerful experience of, <laughs> of my world. And she just sort of looked at me and said, that's nice. And then she went back to everything else. And so I was so demoralized. I thought, what was I thinking? Oh my God, you know, like this hero worship for years, I've been carrying this Bible with me. And, um, and then ironically years, a few more years passed before 
my boss had, was mutual friends with a friend of Helen's and we became friends and, um, and, and then we started, then, then again, I, I owe it to Helen because this new memoir, I was very, very resistant to writing. I mean, look what writing my first memoir got me. I got killed off with that. And so Helen's like, you should really write about this. <laughs> like, I think not. And uh, she said, no, this is really, really important. And so she helped me through uh, for the next couple decades. Um, so I owe an enormous debt of gratitude, not only for making, giving me the inkling that, oh, we might have something in common with the Holocaust, but then having the courage to write. So that was big. Yeah, and we are so great for, grateful to Helen Epstein for, you know, encouraging you to open up your story to the world. Um, we have time for just a couple more questions. So this one actually relates to what you were just saying. Um, it comes from Debbie Rothstein, who asks um, if she needs to read your first, your first book before reading The Escape Artist. Are they sequels or are, are they standalones? They are standalone. Um, I give enough information about my parents' background that you don't have to read the first book to read the second one. Um, the second book is much more my story and my sister's story and, um, you know, what happens on the American side of, this, of the, the Fremonts or our family. But um, the first story goes into much more detail of recreating my mother's and father's separate survivals of the war and is very skimpy on any information about my sister and my relationship. But you get enough in, in the escape artist to know the parents, what the parents have come through. Great. And the last question that we'll take for today comes from Dale Neal, who asks, as a writer, do you think you've come to terms with your family history in these two books, or is there more to explore? Well, one thing I've learned is that as soon as I go, I'm all done. Thank goodness I'm done with that. I find <laughs> out, you know, kaboom. So I don't know. The next thing I'll probably find out is that, in fact, we're Buddhist and we're linked somehow to Tibet. I don't know. I, so I, I'm very hesitant to say, yep, that's it. Because when I last did that, I spent the next 20 years discovering I had a whole lot more that I didn't know. But now I would like to say, yes, this is it. And I can finally return to fiction for which growing up in my family was very good training. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Helen Fremont and Helen Epstein. Um, uh, we will have a recording of this program uh, posted to YouTube, most likely for, for those who, who missed out on it. Um, I encourage everyone to go out and get Helen Fremont's book, The Escape Artist. It is out now with Simon Schuster. Um, and thank you. Uh, look out for other programs, the Museum of Get Helen Heritage. Epstein's book, too. Get Helen <laughs> Epstein's new book, Francie's War. Um, and stay tuned for more events from the Museum of Jewish Heritage. We're trying to do these uh, twice a week. Um, and, and yeah, thank you so much, you guys.